Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 24, page 1069. For you have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. And if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. And the appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. Instead, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels in festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to God, who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, to Jesus, mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, inside your newsletters, there's an outline there on the left-hand side, some household questions top right. Uh, if you haven't uh, managed to catch some of the other sermons, uh, I give thanks for technology and the ability of people to use it. Uh, all the sermons from this series are on our website uh, and we're meeting still uh, this week and next week uh, for the summer study series on the veranda at the vicarage, five o'clock, bring your own dinner except for tonight because Ray's bringing brisket, so please come along. And uh, then six o'clock for a Bible study, seven o'clock uh, we head home. Uh, the new Bible study series will be available next week and we're continuing our series in Matthew and that will be right throughout first term. And so Bible study booklets on Matthew and also uh, the household devotions on Matthew will be available next week uh, for you to pick up. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. Uh, Steve's already asked the question, Andrew's posed the question, but let me reiterate the question. What is the purpose of church? That's uh, a good question. Uh, I'll phrase it that way on purpose because I want us to identify a certain attitude that reigns supreme in our world. We like to do things to achieve a purpose, don't we? Uh, we plough for a purpose. We plant for a purpose. We read for this purpose. We study and learn for that purpose. We go to church for this purpose. Well, how would you answer that? How would you answer what is the purpose of church? Uh, let me give you some of the common answers that I've heard over a number of years. The purpose of church is to worship God. The purpose of church is to glorify God. The purpose of church is to deal with sin. The purpose of church is the building up in knowledge of the Christian. Now, let me be very clear in line with what Steve said in his kids' talk, they are all very good things, aren't they? They are great things. They are right things. They are things that God encourages his people to do. He even commands them to do them. They're all good things we do at church. But are they the purpose of church? You see, Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells me that every day is the day I worship God. Each day is the day I glorify God in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. The dealing of my sin happens at the person of Jesus, Romans 3, 21 to 26. The building up of God's people as his disciples happens by the Spirit through the Word in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. So what's the purpose of church? We're going to look at that now, but let me pray. Father, thanks for your Word. Thanks for its clarity. Thanks for its availability. Uh, we're almost swamped by Bibles here, and we give you thanks that we can sit and open them and read them and think upon them and by your Spirit digest your word and by your spirit apply it. Father, please do that in us today as we think about the, the purpose of church. Amen. Well, I'm at point two on the outline, as Andrew pointed out at the start of the last three weeks, we've looked at three questions. Uh, what is church? Uh, who builds the church? Who makes up the church? What is church? A church is the physical gathering of God's people in one place at one time by God, around God, with God. Uh, who builds the church? The church is built by Jesus, who is the mediator and maturer. Who makes up the church? 
Church is made up of Christians, people who've had their lives forgiven, their sins forgiven by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And each week we've driven home that church in heaven, which is happening now, is the template and foundation for what we do here on earth. Church is already happening in heaven, eternally. It will exist forever and it sets the model for what we do now. So we we can rephrase our question, can't we, like we've done every week. What's the purpose of church can be rephrased as what do people do in heaven? What do people do in heaven? I'm at point three on the outline and Hebrews 12 each week has given us a vision of that, hasn't it? Uh, It's a picture that we started with each week and if you've got it open there in verse 22, you'll see it has one verb, one doing word, you have come. That's it. That's it. There are no other doing words in the passage. You've come. you gathered. You've been. Come with me to Revelation 21, and we'll see if we can unpack a little more of what that means. Revelation 21, that was one of the readings uh, Max brought us. Revelation's a little further towards the back of your Bible. Uh, A magnificent passage, Revelation 21, 1 to 4. Uh, Revelation is a very simple book. It talks about Jesus. Uh, It talks about who he is, what he's done. Uh, It's a way that we understand who we are now. Uh, The vision we have of Jesus sustains God's people now and it gives us a glimpse of what is already happening in heaven. Listen to this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea existed no longer. I also saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for a husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will exist no longer. Grief, crying and pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. That's a description of church in heaven. What are they doing? What's the purpose? Well, did you see it there? They're dwelling together. God is dwelling with men. He will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. God's people gathered by God with God in his presence, in one place. God dwells with his mob. His mob dwells with God. He's their God. They're his people. They're there together, gathered. And now there are, when you read through Revelation, you'll find there's a lot of stuff going on in the gathering. No mistake about that. But the gathering is never described as having those purposes. They don't gather to do those things. They gather to gather. That seems really strange in our world where we're so purpose-driven, doesn't it? Where we do something to achieve something else. But the purpose of church is church. Let me say that again. The purpose of church is church. The gathering of God's people with God. Let me rephrase that in a slightly different way, using a word we're a little more familiar with, the word Steve brought to our attention in the kids' talk. The purpose of church is fellowship, to be gathered together with God and his people. God's people do not do church for any other reason than to do church, to share fellowship with each other and with God. The purpose of church is not to sing, to read the Bible, to pray, to worship, to glorify God. The purpose of church is fellowship, to meet with God and each other. Now, before we go any further, let me just clarify that with two comments. Uh, We need to define fellowship, don't we? Uh, 
A fellowship's a lovely word. It's warm and fuzzy, but we often bandy it around without actually trying to work out what it means. A fellowship is the meeting of like-minded people enjoying each other. Fellowship is the meeting of like-minded people enjoying each other. It, It involves gathering necessarily. You can't enjoy each other if you're not together. A fellowship involves people of like mind, in this case, living as humans in a God-intended way with your sins forgiven. And fellowship is a delight, an enjoyment, a a, a pleasure. And the second clarifying comment is uh, the purpose of church is fellowship doesn't mean that those other things are not important or not done in church, things like singing, praying, reading the Bible. It's just they're not the purpose for church. Fellowship is the purpose and it's expressed in all those things, in what we read, in how we sing, that we pray. For example, church will glorify God, but it's the existence of church that glorifies God. It's a consequence. The purpose of church is fellowship. Now, When I've said that to some people, it's been a little bit of a shock. But let me encourage you to see this as actually God's purpose right throughout history, right throughout time. I'm at point four on the outline because that reading that we had from Ephesians chapter 1 helps us see that this is the fulfilment of all of God's plans in history, God's desire for history. God's purpose in history, I think, look from one angle, is all about gathering a people to live with him. Gathering a people to live with him. Listen again, Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 14. I'm going to read a little bit, jump down to verse 10, jump down to verse 13. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself, according to his favour and will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he favoured us with in the Beloved. Down in verse 10, to bring everything together in the Messiah, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. Down in verse 13, in him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in him when you believed, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Before the beginning of time, God's purpose was to have a mob to meet with him and for him to be able to meet with them, to dwell together, to enjoy each other, to be enjoyed by God. Ephesians, if you remember back to 2019, is the account of how God achieves this, uniting two people groups that are enemies, Jews and non-Jews, uniting people from every walk of life into a mob that can dwell with him. And that's God's purpose right throughout history, to create a people to live with him. If you cast your mind back to the start of the Bible, what's happening there? God doing that, isn't it? God dwelling with his people. He walks with Adam and Eve. They enjoy each other. They dwell together. They're in fellowship. They're gathered just as he created and planned. And what happens in Genesis chapter 3? That great immovable thing called sin smashes down there between God and people. And as God judges sin and as he judges his people, they're separated. They cannot dwell together. And the rest of the Bible is the account of God's efforts before the beginning of time to bring he back to his people. And time and time again, God does that, doesn't he? Right throughout the Bible, God gathers his people to himself and lo and behold, what happens? They turn away, don't they? Again and again and again until finally God's plan, everything in history pointing towards this reaches its climax in who? Jesus Christ. He lives how every human should have lived so that he can die what every human deserves and he rises to show that he's beaten 
sin for anyone who turns to him so that God can dwell with his people. So when you look at the purpose of church like that, it's amazing, isn't it? The purpose of church is actually the climax of history. It's the end point of all history. This is what God intended. A people from every tribe, nation, language and tongue, from every walk of life who've had their sins forgiven to dwell with him. One of the dominant images for church in the Bible, I'm at point five on the outline, and Andrew touched on this in 1 Corinthians 12, one of the dominant images for church in the Bible is the body. In fact, that's at the heart of our memory verse, Ephesians 4, 15 to 16. Uh, next week, remember, we've got the memory verse challenge. Now, if you think about a body, what's the purpose of a body? The whole purpose of a body is to be a body, isn't it? It's to exist, to be in one place at one time, knitted together with each part working to make sure the body is the body. It's no mistake that God chose that as one of his images to describe the church. And at the heart of that is fellowship. Like-minded parts living together, enjoying each other. That's a strange description of a body, but it is, isn't it? And so it's an appropriate description of a church. And the obvious question then is what that kind of fellowship looks like. And next week we're going to look at what we do in church and that's going to cover how the church is built up, how the fellowship is expressed and enabled and maintained and sustained. But we've also got to, what's the flavour of this fellowship? How is it different to any other fellowship in town? Because there's a lot of fellowship that goes on in town, isn't there? The Pony Club at the Sporting Shooters Association at the Blue Boars Rugby Club. That's all versions of fellowship, isn't it? What's different about this fellowship? Well, two things stand out before we come to our final point. First, the fellowship that is the purpose of church is fellowship amongst whom? Amongst Christians. That was our conclusion in the first talk, wasn't it? There are no non-Christians in heaven. That's the like-mindedness of the gathering of God's people in church. Fellowship, as it is described in the Bible as the purpose of church, is enjoyed by Christians with other Christians. Logically and theologically, that makes sense. The like-mindedness is based on having our sins forgiven, isn't it? On knowing who we are before God and what Jesus has done for us. Others are welcome to join us in the gathering and to observe that fellowship and all of its goodness, which brings me to the second thing about that fellowship. It's characterised by love, isn't it? John chapter 15, verse 12, as Jesus has his last long conversation with his disciples, love one another as I've loved you. That's the flavour, isn't it? That's the smell the odour of our gathering, it's self-sacrificial for the other person. It's gracious and merciful. It's patient and forbearing. It's truthful and transparent. It overlooks slights and divisions that become chasms in this world. It delights in others and it treasures the forgiveness of sins and the humility that goes with it. That's the smell of fellowship that comes from a gathering that is colourblind, wage blind, clothing blind, background blind. That's the love that expresses the love that God has shown to us when he brought rebels into his presence by his son. That's the love that everyone should see when they walk into our gatherings. When we start, I'm at the last point on the outline. We started by asking, what's the purpose of church? We then rephrase that question in light of what's happening in heaven now. So the question became, what do people do in heaven? And when we looked at Hebrews 12 and Revelation 21, we saw that 
They gather in heaven. They have fellowship in heaven. They dwell together. That's it. The purpose of church is church, fellowship with God and his people. It's of like-minded people enjoying each other. It's fellowship characterised by love as people who've had their sins together dwell together. Well, that leads to a number of observations. You'll see them there on your outline. The first observation is this. Church is an end in itself. It's not a means to anything else. I think this is perhaps the most revolutionary observation for a bloke like me. I'm pretty purpose-driven. I like to achieve stuff. I like to tick off boxes. But for me, this conclusion, this observation, radically changed my understanding of church. It seems to go against everything that our world thinks about church, even what we think about church. We don't do church for any other reason than church, than to be gathered in fellowship with God and each other. Now, I think there's a very important consequence of this when you look at the Bible, when you look at that unfolding revelation of God and his plans, because it helps us see what church does in the Bible, so to speak, and what's the responsibility of the people of God. We gather as the people of God for fellowship, church, and then we go out into the world. And throughout the Bible, God commands the people of God to do specific things in the world. One of them that stood out for me over time is evangelism. Telling people about Jesus is the responsibility of whom? The people of God. The people of God. Church has as its purpose fellowship so that we then go out into the world to tell people about Jesus. Are we doing that? Are we sharing the goodness of Jesus who deals with our sins? Welcoming others in to the dwelling with God who has made us. Are we doing that? Observation two, the goodness of fellowship is tangible. It's appealing to God and to others. There's a delight of like-minded people gathering together. There is a love of being in each other's presence. There is an enjoyment of that. Is, Is that a description of us? A delight? A love? Gee, I'm going to see this person this week, an enjoyment of everyone from every walk, there is an an attraction of fellowship. What other community in town is so humble and so open? (laughs) So humble because we know where we stand before God, who we are truly amongst each other, and so open because we know that this is available to anyone. Observation three, fellowship has limits. Fellowship has limits. And by this I'm thinking between gatherings. What's the like-mindedness that draws us together? Who we are as sinners, what Jesus alone has done for us, and the hope of heaven eternally. That's the chalk that draws the limits on our fellowship. So that when some other gathering says, you want to do fellowship together, we should be asking these questions, shouldn't we? In fact, this is going to be a very important question for the denomination of Anglicanism this year, isn't it? At our General Synod in May, this question will be in front of us. Who can I share fellowship with? And finally, observation four. Did you know that you were coming to the climax of history this morning? And that's what this is, isn't it? The climax of history. Who else can gather such a different group of people together? Who else can remove our sins and give us perfection? Except God alone, and this is his aim. 
And so as we come to church, let me encourage you to have this attitude, serious gravity. (laughs) We're gathered with God and his people as sinners with our sins forgiven, but also great gladness, isn't there? How good is it to gather, to have our sins forgiven, to be able to meet with people from every walk of life in openness and transparency and truth and generosity and mercy and kindness and love, forbearance, the climax of history, gravity and gladness as we meet together. Let me pray. Father, thanks uh, for wanting, for desiring, uh, for working uh, towards dwelling with your image bearers. Uh, Broken, rebellious, arrogant, apathetic. Uh, You've worked to remove our sin through Jesus alone. By faith we have received what you have already done for us. And so we can walk into the presence of other like-minded people and dwell with you. Thank you for this today. Thank you for that eternally. Our Father, we pray that you'll give us the smell of love so that the nature of this gathering will be so good that it will draw others to know that truth that will transform them, that we will tell them that truth that will transform them. In Jesus' name, amen. Any quick questions? Yeah, Roz. It's a, it's a good question. So Roz has asked the question uh, that a lot of people have probably been asking uh, over the last few weeks. If a husband and wife or a household meets together, is that church in the ways, in what we've described? Is that your question, Roz? Yeah. So it's a really good question, and I think it will be the case in certain parts of the world and at certain times. But when we go back to the start, when we talked about the ecclesia, okay, which was in the first sermon, which was the gathering of all the people who had a say or membership in the community. That's the foundation for church. So if, for example, in a certain part of a country uh, which is, you know, opposed to the gospel, there is one household that knows and loves Jesus, when they gather, that's church in that neck of the woods, and it fully reflects what's happening in heaven. But in a place like Narrabri, where we have the freedom to gather and do these kinds of things together without fear of persecution or opposition, gathering like this is church. And those are subsets of that to encourage us as we walk in daily life. I think that's why the word ecclesia is so important, because of all the baggage it carries with it. So when God chose that word to describe his church, He was thinking of something bigger. Now, let me just go on a slight tangent, and this came up at Bible study the other day. Uh, Matthew 18 mentions a section that a lot of people use to talk about that. Can anyone remember the verse? When two or three are gathered together, I will be with them. Uh, I'm just going to go out, and, and I'll explain this later on if you want me to. That's actually not a description of church. It's a description of church discipline. Okay, And so it's not put there in the Bible to say this is the baseline for what church is. It's put there in the context of Jesus saying this is how you're to do church discipline. And so ecclesia is so important. All the people who can officially gather, who have a say and a membership in the community are gathered.